A very warm welcome to our Sunday morning service. My name's Chris and I'm the pastor here at Elmwood Church. We trust that you're going to enjoy worshipping God with us. We've been so excited by how many people have been viewing these virtual services. Uh, we've just done the maths and about 260 sets of people have been watching uh, these services across uh, both versions that we put out. So that's so encouraging. And people are watching the services way beyond the congregation of Elmwood. People who have never actually been into Elmwood Church have been watching our services week by week. And, and we praise God for that and pray that God will use these services very dramatically in people's lives. This Sunday morning, we're going to be focusing very much our worship on the Lord's Supper. And uh, we're looking forward towards the end of the service, celebrating all that Jesus did for us in giving his body and shedding his blood that we might know life. Good morning. My name is Abby and I have the pleasure of leading you in worship today. So please feel free to find a space in your homes to sit or to stand and to just worship with me through these songs.
morning, my name is Fee and I hope that you're okay this morning. The situation that we find ourselves in is one that we would never have imagined a few months ago and it is affecting all of us in lots of different ways. For some of us, we might have been sick by the virus, we might have loved ones that are poorly, um, some of us might even have relatives that are in hospital. Some of us have sadly lost our jobs or are worried about losing our jobs and therefore have financial worries. Some of us are working on the front line for the NHS or as a key worker um, or have relatives that are. We're separated from our families, from our friends and the way that we live has just completely changed. And I think if we're all honest, no matter how strong our faith is, there are times when we have a wobble and there are moments when we, we just kind of wonder what on earth is happening and where is God in all of this. And I think it's really important during these times of difficulty that we tell stories and retell stories of things that have happened in the past, of times when God has been faithful and times when God has been good because I think it's when we hear these stories that it reminds us that God is with us and that there is never a situation um, where God isn't and God is always with us through everything that we go through. So this morning I would like to tell you a story and my story is from Bokaji. Um, surprise, surprise, I hear you say. Um, but I'm not sorry because the, God is doing some amazing things in Bokaji. And I think it's really important that we hear those stories and we retell those stories because it encourages us and reminds us that God is good and God is faithful, even through the difficult times. And I would like to tell you a story about a boy. And I have a picture of him here, if I can just get it. And his name is Kassa. And I don't know whether you can see that, but this is Kassa. And Kassa is one of the boys who has just gone to university. And so this time last year, he was getting ready to sit his final year, final exams at school and, and then head to university. Kassa is really clever and has always dreamed of becoming a doctor. Uh, I think lots of children around the world dream of becoming doctors, but actually for Kassa, it was a dream that we knew would be realized because he really is very clever. And so um, all of the students took their exams and when the exams results came out at the end of the summer, Kassa had done really, really well and was very, very excited about his future. In Ethiopia, when you go to university, the government decide where they send you based on the results that you have uh, managed to get. But you do have an element of choice and before you sit your exams, they ask you to submit your university choices. And these are listed from one to about 25. And there's so many choices that each student is required to put down on their list. And um, from this 25, depending on your score, the government will allocate you uh, and send you to a university. So based on the score that Kassar had got, he was really optimistic that he would do really well and that he would end up going to one of his top choices to study medicine. I was actually in Bokaji in October with a friend when the results, when the, the, the allocation of places came, were, were given out and um, Kassar was given his choice of university and he was absolutely devastated. Um, he was given his number two choice, but actually it was um, a choice that he had recorded way down his list, maybe, uh, I think he said maybe around 22. And we're not really sure what happened, whether it was through Cass's own mistake or whether someone had tampered with his list, but somehow his choice 22 had become his number two choice. And he was just devastated and he came to see me and he said, Fee, I don't know what I'm going to do. There is no way that I'm going to be able to be a doctor because they don't even study medicine at that university. He went to see um, the people in the government offices in Bokaji uh, to plead his case and to say, look, there's been a mistake. I don't know what's happened, 
but they weren't interested and they suggested that perhaps he go to Addis and try his luck there in one of the big offices. So off he went on the bus to Addis Ababa to the government offices there and explained that what had happened, that he'd been given this choice that was actually recorded as his second, but it wasn't his second, it was his 22nd choice. Uh, and could they do something to change that based on the fact that he was a very uh, strong student and had a good score. Again, they weren't really interested and they said to him, I'm sorry, this is the way it is and this is where you're going to have to go to university. The night before some of them left for university, I and my friend invited a group of the boys that had been our translators over the past few years to come for a chicken dinner. And this is something that I often do when I go to Bokaji, I cook a, a roast chicken dinner for, for some of the, uh, the high school boys. And we had our meal and then we sat and we sang and we prayed and, and we had a time of, of, to, of giving advice for the students as they left for university. And we prayed for each of the students in turn and we really sensed God's presence in an amazing way that night. And as we prayed for Casa, we prayed into his situation that God would bless him, that God would be with him, and that even though the situation had turned out differently to how he imagined, that God would somehow work in the situation uh, and still bring his plan um, for Casa's life into fruition. Off the boys went to university, I came back to the UK, and several weeks later, I got an email from Casa who was just so excited and said, Fee, you'll never believe what's happened. The principal addressed all the students as we arrived and said that for the very first time in the history of the university, they were going to be offering medicine as a discipline. He was so excited. Uh, the students were told that during their first general year of study where the students kind of study a mix of subjects, they would be examined at the end of the year and those students that were the strongest would then be eligible to sit uh, an exam to get into the medical school um, department of, of the university. And Casa said he was going to work really hard and try to get a place in, in this medical school. Not long before let, uh, lockdown, um, Casa wrote to me and sent me his results for the year and they were incredible. He had got A's across the board in some subjects, he'd almost got 100% and he was given the opportunity along with, with others to, to sit for the entrance exam for medical school. There were 250 students that sat that exam. There were 40 places on offer and I think you know what I'm going to say next. When all of the students were ranked in order of their score, CASA came ninth and he has been given a place to study medicine in his university from um, September or whenever university restarts for the students. And I just absolutely love that story. In fact, every time I retell it or I think about it, it gives me goosebumps because I just think it is an insane story. We had a situation that seemed so hopeless and everything just seemed stacked against Casa, and yet here, he finds himself now doing what he, he wanted to do all along. And I've heard very recently actually that even some of the students that ended up going to some of the best universities in the country through, for different reasons have not been able to, to get a place on the medical course even though they had a score that was high enough. So I just think it is incredible. And I just want to encourage you this morning that if, you are, if your situation does seem dark and hopeless, and I think for so many of us at the moment, it does, or even not all the time, some of us have days when it feels that way, I would like you to remember this story and to think about God. We have a God who is good, we have a God who is mighty, and we have a God that brings hope in even the most hopeless of situations. Thank you. I'm going to start our prayers today by reading from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 5, verses 14 to 16. And then as I pray, I will leave moments of silence during which we can all make the prayers our own. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, 
let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Heavenly Father, we are amazed that you know us each one individually. You love us and you care about every aspect of our lives. At a time when many of us may be feeling sadness, disappointment, loss, isolation and insecurity, we are so thankful to know that not only do you stand beside us, but in fact you live within us by your Holy Spirit. We don't want to deny or run away from our sadness, our disappointments and our challenges. We don't need to, because we believe that you show up in all of these situations. We thank you, Lord, that you understand what we're going through, that you want to be close to us. You are close to us and you want us to know that. You want us to know how much we're loved. And we're so grateful at a time when perhaps we're at a distance from those we love and those who love us. We're so grateful that we're never at a distance from you. Lord, we want to pray that you would show us how we can reach out to others and bless them. And Heavenly Father, at this time, we want to pray especially for children and young people, those at Elmwood, those in our families, those of our neighbours, those across this city who are feeling confused and disorientated and maybe lost because they can't be with their friends, their teachers, in their schools. Many will feel that they've lost something important and maybe won't know who to talk to or how to express their feelings. Lord, we bring them to you. We pray, Lord, that they would find you, that they would be able to talk to you. We pray for their parents and carers, that you would give them wisdom and patience and love and grace at a time that's challenging for all of us. And we trust you, Lord, that you will bring good things from this situation for each one of us. You have promised in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, that all things work together for good for those who love you, who are called according to your purpose. And we trust that even in this difficult situation, you will turn things around for good for us and for those who love you. We thank you, Lord, for those in our fellowship who are working hard to support us, to support other people, those on the front line. We ask for your blessing. We ask for your protection for them. And we thank you, Lord, for our brothers and sisters who are serving you at this time. We thank you, Lord, that not only do we speak to you and we know that you hear us, but you speak to us. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to hear your voice, to know your presence in a very real way and to know your Holy Spirit's direction in all that we do. We thank you, Lord, that we can come to you, that you're our father, that you love us, you care for us and you want the best for us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you have trouble remembering things? Is there anything that you've ever forgotten? For me, it's things like tidying up or putting things away in the right place. Sorry, Martin. Even though I'm grown up, I still have trouble remembering things. But there are lots of tricks that can help us 
One of the oldest tricks is a simple piece of string. People used to tie a piece of string around their finger to help them remember something they were supposed to do. The only problem is, if you forget the thing you were supposed to do, then the string is pretty useless. Post-it notes were invented to help us remember things. You just write the thing that you need to remember on the post-it note, but you have to remember to read it afterwards. Being forgetful isn't new. It's been done since the beginning of time. The night that Jesus was betrayed, he was eating with his friends. He knew that he would soon return to the Father in heaven, and he wanted to make sure that his friends would remember him after he was gone. So he did something that would help them. As they were eating, he took a piece of bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. When you eat the bread, remember me. Then he took a glass of wine and he held it up and he said, this is my blood, which was shed for you. When you drink it, remember me. He did this to remind them that when he died, he was starting a special relationship with them and God. It's been over 2000 years since that night and we are still doing the same thing to remember Jesus. When we take communion, we will eat some bread and drink from a cup so that we can remember that Jesus died so that we could have a special relationship with God. Later on, we will do this as a family in our homes. And as we eat and drink, we can remember Jesus, just like he asked us to. The reading today is from the book of Matthew, chapter 26, verses 17 to 30. And I'm reading from the TNIV version. The Last Supper. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for the Passover meal? He replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the 12. And while they were eating, he said, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, Surely not I, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had never been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus answered, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. When they'd sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This morning, we're really focusing on the Lord's Supper. It does us good to be reminded of the importance of what we do as Christians. Celebrating the Lord's Supper together as a church is something that we do regularly. It's an essential part of our Christian lives and holds great meaning. I want to remind us of the significance of Holy Communion and to look closely at how we should approach the Lord's 
table. Let me first say that the Lord's Supper is one of only two religious rites or sacraments that Jesus initiated. The other is believer's baptism. Believer's baptism is only observed once by each person. It is a sign of the beginning of the individual's Christian life. The Lord's Supper, by contrast, is to be observed repeatedly throughout our Christian lives. It is a sign of continuing in fellowship with Christ. Jesus initiated the Lord's Supper as was read to us in Matthew chapter 26. Let me read verses 26 to 29 again to you. Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 to 29. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a song, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Paul adds the following sentences from the tradition he received. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We will focus more closely on the Lord's Supper by answering two questions. So the first question I want us to consider, consider together as we think about the Lord's Supper is what is the meaning of the Lord's Supper? The meaning of the Lord's Supper is rich and full. It, it symbolises and affirms several things. First of all, it symbolises Christ's death. Our actions give a picture of his death for us. The breaking of the bread symbolises that Christ's body was offered for us. When the cup is poured out, it symbolises that Christ's blood was shed for us. This is why participating in the Lord's Supper is also a kind of proclamation. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 26 says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It also symbolizes that we participate in the benefits of Christ's death. As we each reach out for the bread and the wine, our actions proclaim we are taking the benefits of Christ's death to ourselves. Thirdly, it symbolizes spiritual nourishment. Ordinary food nourishes our physical bodies. The bread and the wine of the Lord's Supper reminds us that Christ nourishes and refreshes our souls. Read with me John chapter 6, verses 53 to 57. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. 
Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. If we do not feed on Christ, we have no life. There is not a literal, this is not a literal eating of his flesh and blood, but a sharing in the benefits of the ransom that Christ paid for us. Without benefiting from his death, we cannot taste eternal life. And fourthly, it symbolizes, communion symbolizes the unity of believers. When we participate together in the Lord's Supper, we give a clear sign of our unity with one another. Paul says, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one bread. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 17. So we're reminded by the Lord's Supper of Christ's death. We're reminded that we benefit from that death, that he nourishes us, and that as a church, we are one. What rich symbolism. By bringing the Lord's Supper into being, Christ is affirming things to us as well. Christ demonstrates his love to us through the communion. In inviting us to the table, we are reassured, we are reassured that we are loved. We are treasured guests around his table. He shows us that all the blessings of salvation are reserved for us as we share together in the Lord's Supper. The fact that he has invited us assures us he has enough for us. You don't invite people to a wedding if you do not have enough food and drink for them. If you've received an invitation, you know that they have catered for you at that special event. And because Jesus invites each of us to the Lord's Supper, we know that his blessings are more than enough for each one of us. Also, Jesus is giving us a foretaste of the great banquet table of the King. Let us read about that end time banquet in Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 to 9. Revelation 19, verses 6 to 9. Then I heard what sounded like great multitude, like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Then the angel said to me, Write, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. This will be the greatest bash ever. This is a party you don't want to miss. This incredible banquet that will happen at the end of time when all of God's people will be gathered together with our Father God. It's not to be missed. Also, as we gather around the table, we are reminded we are part of Christ's eternal family. At this time of lockdown, we are gathering around tables together as households to have our meals. It's about being part of the family. And as we come together for communion, as we come around the Lord's table together, even if it's virtually, it speaks of the fact that we're all part of one treasured and loved family. Finally, in sharing in the Lord's Supper, we affirm our faith in Christ. As we take the bread and the wine for ourselves, we are proclaiming, we need you and trust you, Lord Jesus, to forgive our sins and give life and health to our souls. 
For only by your broken body and your shed blood can we be saved. Every time we participate in the Lord's Supper, we proclaim our sins were part of the cause of Jesus' suffering and death. So the first question that we addressed is, what is the meaning of the Lord's Supper? The second question I want us to think about is, who should participate in the Lord's Supper? Only those who believe in Jesus Christ should take part, because it is a sign of being a Christian and continuing in the Christian life. If you do not know Christ as your personal Lord and Saviour, do not share in the bread and wine out of a sense of ritual. Those who participate in the Lord's Supper must examine themselves. Let me read to you 1 Corinthians 11, verses 20 to 22. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. The celebration of the Lord's Supper in the early church included a feast or a fellowship meal. The wealthy brought lovely food hampers, but failed to share what they had with the poorer members of the church. This was not good preparation for communion. They were supposed to be one body in Christ, united and inter interdependent through their shared faith in Christ. However, their actions denied this unity. They looked only to their own personal needs. When we come to the Lord's table, we must give thought to our relationships within the body of Christ. Are we acting in ways that show unity or disunity? Do we demonstrate the same kind of self-giving sacrifice as our Lord? Or do we show selfishness and enmity? As we come to the Lord's Supper, are our relationships in the body of Christ reflecting the character of the Lord whom we meet there and represent? Do we examine ourselves as we are instructed? In conclusion, let me say that one of the most wonderful things for me about the Lord's Supper is the beautiful sense of God's presence when we approach the table in the right manner. The bread and the wine symbolize the body and blood of Christ. They give us a visible sign of the fact that Christ is truly present with us. Christ's death on our behalf means we can enter into the very presence of God. We can pass into the very Holy of Holies. We can move into the inner sanctuary. We can enter into full fellowship with God. As we move in a moment into the Lord's Supper, remember the rich meaning of this sacrament. If you are a believer, you are welcome to participate, but examine yourself first. Finally, enjoy the wonderful sense of Christ's presence with us as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Allow me to invite you to the Lord's Supper. Come to this sacred table, not because you must, but because you may. Come not to testify that you are righteous, but that you sincerely love our Lord Jesus Christ and desire to be his true disciples. Come not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Not because you have any claim on heaven's rewards, but because in your frailty and sin, you stand in constant need of heaven's mercy and help. 
Let's take a moment to reflect. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to search our hearts, to see if there's anything that we need to say sorry for, if there's anything we need to repent of, to confess to him. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. The Apostle Paul tells us of the institution of the Lord's Supper. For the tradition which I handed on to you came to me from the Lord himself, that on the night of his arrest, the Lord Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks to God, broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in memory of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. Allow me to lead you in a prayer of thanksgiving for all that Christ has done for us. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we do thank you for the bread that reminds us that you gave up your body for us. We thank you for the wine that reminds us that you shed your blood, that we might have life. What an incredible, all-sufficient sacrifice you made for each one of us. We want to thank you for all the blessings that have come into our life through your death and your resurrection. Thank you, Lord, that through your death and your resurrection, we have died to sin and been raised up to new life with you. Thank you that we have an eternity with you to enjoy now and to look forward to. Thank you for all that you have done for us, Lord Jesus. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Jesus said, This is my body which is broken for you. Eat in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this in memory of me. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen.
I'm so pleased that we've been able to spend time together this Sunday morning worshipping God and, and focusing on the Supper of our Lord. Allow me now to close with a blessing. Go into God's world with joy and peace and love and hope in your hearts. And the blessing of Almighty God, Creator, Redeemer and Sustainer, be with you all. Amen.